very proud and happy to have uh, Dr. Tanner Mirlees here as a special guest. Um, Tanner is a critical pl political economist of digital media technologies and the cultural industries. And he is the co-author with fellow Ontario tech prof uh, Shahid Alvi of EdTech Inc. Selling, Automating and Globalizing Higher Education in the Digital Age, which we are going to talk about today. Um, Tanner's going to give a short lecture. I'm going to hand it right over to you, Tanner, and uh, and let you do your thing. Great. Well, thanks so much, Bill, and it's a real pleasure to be here. And good afternoon to to everyone uh, in today's class. Um, I'm going to present probably for about 35 to 40 minutes. I guess a standard lecture um, that gives you a synopsis or sort of broad overview of the book's arguments and some of the critical issues it raises. Um, so I guess without further ado, um, I'll get going. My presentation today is called GAFM's EdTech Game Plan, Platforming, Automating, and Globalizing Education in a Digital Age. Okay, so here we go. It is common to read that we, the collective we, the capital W-E, we, are living in a new digital age due to the mass diffusion, use, and impact of digital technologies. Everything is imagined to be changing, even the institutions of public education at all levels, from kindergarten through to uh, grad studies um, at university. And this has especially been the case, of course, over the past nine, 10 months or so, um, due to the COVID-19 pandemic and the transformation of many things at many levels. And so even before the pandemic started, we could read a cover story in The Economist, sort of like creative destruct destruction, reinventing the university for the digital age. And more recently, we sort of see The Economist publishing, you know, cover stories with, um, you know, titles like The Absent Student, How COVID-19 Will Change College. Um, we can sort of look a little sort of further to sort of other sources and see all kinds of statements and claims about what digital technology or the digital age is doing or will do or already has done uh, to, to universities and our learning experiences. And so uh, digital revolution demands changes to education. You know, notice how the revolution is sort of taken for granted, like there is a revolution happening and there's really no attempt to define what that revolution is qualitatively or who's leading it. Most of the time it's technology that's in this sort of driver's seat of revolutionary change, but it's also that it's demanding something of us. It's demanding something from professors, from university administrators and from you, from the students that are part of this learning experience. It's demanding us to change. Um, we also have these kind of statements like higher education needs to go digital or go home. This is Simon Nelson, CEO of Future Learn, which is sort of a big ed tech kind of uh, website that um, is sponsored by a lot of ed tech firms to sort of create a lot of publicity and a lot of hype and a lot of buzz um, about where education is going in the digital age. But you know, higher education needs to go digital or go home. Um, you have these sort of types of statements being made. So at the forefront of this revolutionary change, as it's sometimes called, is something called ed tech. You know, ed tech. Um, it's a big word today. But what is this? What does ed tech mean? So clear definitions of ed tech are actually in short supply. And this is largely because the meaning of technology itself, not just digital technology, but all technology, as you probably learned from this course, is very messy and complex. What are we really referring to when we use terms like technology or digital technology or educational technology? You know, there's no really clear and agreed upon meaning um, for these terms. There's no sort of definite scholarly consensus that we can draw upon. So what we have is a lot of concepts, a lot of different definitions and a lot of connotative meanings attaching to these signs. Nonetheless, the ed tech keyword tends to refer to any digital technology, that being an assemblage of hardware and software, uh, you know, like a laptop computer or a smartphone combined with some sort of, you know, program that runs on it. You know, so EdTech's really just a keyword for any digital technology made for use or used by teachers and learners in any context for means and ends deemed educational. That's a very broad, broad definition of EdTech. Um, but it's a useful one, given how complex and messy this whole situation has become. Um, I want to sort of flag the point, however, that educational technology or EdTech should not be equated with digital technology per se. Too often in the 21st century, we conflate the sort of two forms. We say that technology automatically equals educational technology. And even when talking about communications technology, we presume that it's digital technology 
um, not sort of sort of pre-existing forms, whether that be sort of papyrus or a pen and paper or parchment or a pencil uh, or some other sort of uh, form of communication technology that predates the digital age. Um, so we want to sort of say, you know, ed tech is not just digital technology. Um, it refers to all kinds of different sort of um, technology made for use or used by teachers and learners in any context for means and ends deemed educational. So long before the digital age, um, you know, people were wielding all kinds of technologies for teaching and learning. So, for example, in 1801, the Scottish headmaster, James Pillins, affixed a big piece of slate to the wall of the classroom, inventing the blackboard. And this blackboard, as you see on the slide, uh, would not have been possible without other pre-existing technologies available. You know, so for example, the machines of mining and refining limestone into a chalky writing utensil. Uh, Pillin's ability to use the mind and hand to craft words with that utensil. The slate board, the chalk, the language, the mind, the human hand, all of this was part of Pillin's blackboard system. So the blackboard, you know, is one very early example of an educational technology that predates the digital age. And, and this was quite, quite different from say, the blackboard of today's digital economy, that being Blackboard Inc., a corporation that thousands of universities and colleges around the world pay for online course management system services and whose revenue in 2018 was about $700 million. Um, so Blackboard and Blackboard, two different historical moments, two different assemblages of technology, um, and two sort of different models of communicating ideas between teachers uh, and, and learners. So even though EdTech's not limited to digital technologies, it's frequently conflated with digital technologies. So surrounding this idea of EdTech are numerous rhetorical claims and statements about the relationship between ed tech, educational institutions, teachers and learners. And this sort of takes us into, I guess, what you'd call the theory of technology and society or the philosophy of technology and society. So I'm gonna review sort of three of these rhetorics of ed tech and society before I move forward and tell you what I actually think about educational technology today. Um, so in other words, here are three mm, popular, but not always useful analytics, you know, for, for talking about, thinking about, or researching educational technology today. So we've got instrumentalism, determinism, and optimism. These are the three ed tech rhetorics that are very pervasive and very popular in the news, in magazines, and uh, elsewhere. So basically, instrumentalism, what's that? Well, ed tech instrumentalism is the idea that teachers and learners are rational agents who exert power over ed tech and use it for ends that they decide. Here, EdTech does not possess the agency to get teachers and learners to do what they might not otherwise do of their own volition. It's just a useful tool. You know, it's the idea that tech is tool, EdTech's a tool. Um, it's a neutral tool. It's something that teachers and learners use to do education with. So from this premise, EdTech's not essentially good or bad, it's value neutral. Because humans are moral creatures and ed tech's not, so goes the argument, ed tech's morality resides in its human use, in the specific ends we put it to. In this regard, judgment should never be made about educational technology in itself, but simply made of what people, teachers and learners are doing with it. Unlike humans, for example, the smartphone does not know what's right and wrong or good or bad for teachers. It cannot discern you know, what's ethical for learners. For the instrumentalist, if the smartphone is having negative effects upon educational processes, this is not the fault of the smartphone, but the fault of the teacher for permitting its usage in some sort of negative way, or the fault of the student for using or abusing it unwisely. So that's kind of how sort of ed tech instrumentalists sort of think. Um, about, about educational technology. Now, next to sort of that, and I'd say the exact sort of opposite of an instrumentalist view of educational technology is the rhetoric of ed tech determinism. This is the idea, you know, basically that teachers and learners are relatively powerless with respect to what educational technology wants and that any new educational technology is itself an agent that acts upon and fundamentally changes teaching and learning in some way for better or worse. And so in this rhetoric, you know, you probably learned a lot about McLuhan, the medium is very much the message. 
Um, and you can read sort of headlines like how technology is transforming education and new technology will turn an old institution of education on its head. So um, the executive summary of The Economist's New Medium Consortium report says the future of higher education, how technology will shape learning, for example. And the idea is that technological innovation is changing the very way that universities teach and students learn. Um, the cover you see in the slide here conveys an archetypal governmentalized image of a white male subject student sitting at the center of the classroom, an island unto himself, immersed in a laptop computer, responsibilizing his learning and taking the initiative to teach himself, absent the professor, absent other students. So in this deterministic rhetoric, um, you know, ed tech, not people, not power relations between people, not policies, not laws, not regulations, not corporations, not institutions, none of these things, but only technology is the primary cause or the agent of the major educational um, changes that we're seeing today. So here, te technology has agency to change the world. Well, people, university administrators, professors, learners are inconsequential. And this is sort of a, a very, very significant, again, way of thinking about educational technology as an agent in and of itself. Um, and in much of the rhetoric today, the idea is that the change ed tech wants to affect is unstoppable, inexorable, inevitable, even irresistible. After all, ed tech is not additive, but ecological. Once it exists and acts upon the world, its effects cannot be undone. So that's ed tech determinism in a nutshell. Now, another sort of sort of way to think about this, and this is also quite quite popular, is edtech optimism. And this is the idea that edtech, uh, whether it be conceptualized as a tool or an agent in itself, is presently moving all of us toward a future educational system in society that is so much better um, than before, better than the past. The notion that new means of communication will become a new and better means of doing education is not unique, however, to the digital age. After all, when we study history, each new communications device considered revolutionary in its respective time, the motion picture projector, the radio, the TV set, the personal computer, all of these communication technologies were reconfigured as educational technologies and then promoted as a new means to improve how professors teach and students learn. So at every moment in the history of communication technology, these technologies have been adapted or converted or applied to educational settings. And there's been a lot of optimism, even utopianism about what they would do for teachers and learners, always making it better than before. Um, above you see an image of a teaching biology and geometry course with a closed circuit TV, and that's from 1965. Um, and the report sort of um, of America's number one think tank, the Brookings Institute, which outlines how ed tech can help leapfrog progress in education. Um, so ed tech optimism encourages us to welcome and embrace all educational technology. Just welcome it, just embrace it. Just say, yes, it's here, it's now, it's better than before. And you know, it invites us to do that. It, it, it cajoles us to do that. Um, you know, without actually pausing and reflecting upon the pros and cons, the opportunities and costs and the positives and negatives of these, these, these developments. Because it's assumed nowadays that ed tech will make education more cost efficient. It will make it more personalized. It will make it more calculable and measurable. It will make it more accessible. We can educate the world. You know, we can reach more people. It will make it more inclusive and integrative. It will make it more democratic and it will make it more market centered, which is assumed to be, of course, better than government or public sort of provisioned education. Moreover, we read that educational technology is making education better than before because it's replacing the elitist sage on the stage, such as me, a professor, or Balin, a professor, with a kind of popular guide on the side. And not just a human guide on the side, like myself or your professor today, but rather an algorithmic guide on the side or a robotic guide on the side. The idea is that we can do away with these human professors and basically substitute them with algorithms or intelligent machines of one kind or of another that will be better teachers than we are. Um, so that's kind of interesting uh, to see. So these are the three big rhetorics surrounding ed tech today. Um, and I'm not impressed by them. They're you know, useful in some ways, um, in some contexts, but they conceal a lot more than they reveal. 
instrumentalism, determinism, and optimism. Very pervasive, you know, very popular, but they don't always prevent us or present us with an analytically useful guide for really understanding the real world of educational technology. Although these rhetorics have great currency and purchase among business leaders, politicians, journalists, and they may also shape the mindset of some educational administrators, teachers and learners, again, they're not really sort of, you know, um, useful analytics for really understanding what's going on in higher education today um, and what agencies are reshaping and shaping it for their ends. So, I wanna argue right at the outset, we cannot sort of think about educational technology as a reified tool or an autonomous agent. Instrumentalism, determinism are flawed analytics. We should not say that this is some reified tool in and of itself, just a thing that anyone can pick up or put down and use for whatever ends they decide. But it's also not satisfactory to basically say that educational technology is an agent that simply you know, makes choices and acts upon the world um, as well. So it's neither a tool nor an autonomous agent. Rather, it's useful to think about educational technology, like all technology, as part and product of what the historian of technology, Thomas Hughes calls a techno-social system, okay? A techno-social system that relies upon many humans, many tools, and many processes to work. So consider, for instance, the um, smartphone, okay? Um, the smartphone, you know, for the last 10 years or so has been touted, promoted as the sort of latest and greatest best thing in educational technology. Um, and we often talk about, you know, the smartphone, the mobile ed tech devices, enabling new and exciting ways of delivering engaging content to students. But, you know, the smartphone, whether it be purpose for ed tech or not, is very much part and product of a very complex society and a very complex system. Now, just think about the conditions of possibility required to bring the smartphone into the classroom or to use it outside of the classroom or to sort of use it in any context deemed educational. So each day, right, child workers descend into the cobalt mines of the Democratic Republic of the Congo to dig up the metal making, um, you know, for the lithium ion batteries powering ed tech smartphones. Um, so that's just even at the level of sort of, you know, what resources, what energy sort of resources, what minerals, um, you know, are required to sort of make this technology go. Um, and then you think about, okay, well, where was this smartphone produced? Where was it manufactured? Sort of what social relations of production shaped the making of the smartphone um, before it actually was purposed as an educational device? And what we learn, of course, is that the smartphone's transnational commodity chain links low-waged workers toiling in China's Foxconn factories and elsewhere to the precarious service workers at the retail stores, at Apple, at Best Buy's, before they're even being placed in the hands of teachers and, and students consumers who purchase and use them for educational ends. And you think, like, what's really powering these devices, this educational technology? Well, engineers develop and redevelop the cellular network that lets teachers and learners communicate through their smartphones. And technicians manage the electricity grid we rely upon to charge up our smartphones before launching into smartphone lectures or engaging dialogical educational exchanges with one another. Um, Electricians wire um, buildings and classrooms with sockets we plug into our chargers and so on. And so, you know, the smartphone again is not just one thing. It's not just one separate standalone autonomous tool, nor is it an autonomous agent that sort of, sort of, you know, makes choices and acts upon us. It's very much something that's socially shaped. It's part and product of society in a complex techno-social system. But, you know, by, by ignoring this, by sort of ignoring the sociality of, of, of technology and educational technology in particular, and concentrating only on EdTech's impact after its diffusion, or speculating about EdTech's material and moral uplift for all, these rhetorics of instrumentalism, determinism, and optimism have very little to say about that techno-social arrangement and about the social structures, organizations, institutions, and power relations surrounding and shaping educational technology today. So they reify or ascribe superpowers to EdTech but disregard the political economy beneath. They invite us to indulge in utopian ed tech imaginaries, but turn us away from ed tech's potential downsides, drawbacks, and consequences. They turn our attention on to what ed tech may give, but they deflect attention away from what ed tech's makers may take away 
from us as teachers, as learners, and from the institutions of public education for democracy. So Shad Alvey and I wrote EdTech Inc. to disrupt these EdTech rhetorics and to propose a different approach, a different way of conceptualizing and analyzing educational technology and society. So in our new book, we wager that to understand EdTech, we should begin with knowledge of the political economy of contemporary capitalism, not technology per se. Political economists of communication have examined the ownership patterns, market structures, business models, and power relations of a wide range of sectors in the information and communication technology and creative and cultural industries, such as the news, television, radio, Hollywood, video games, and social media platforms, as you know from taking this great course, Phelan. Yet EdTech has largely fallen outside of the purview of the political economy of communication. Um, and Shad and I wanted to write a book to kind of bring EdTech into that and political economy into current studies of educational technology. So we tried to build upon the political economy of communications tradition to forge what we call a political economy of EdTech or the PE of EdTech. And this is an approach that's holistic, historical, guided by moral philosophy, and also committed to praxis. So we intended our book very much. We were sort of writing our book largely um, to present an alternative point of view uh, as compared to that presented by, I guess, what you'd call uncritical educational technology researchers. You know, um, the study of educational technology can sort of sometimes loosely or heuristically be divided into two camps, critical and uncritical. Um, Neil Selwyn, one of the sort of best educational technology researchers and critical theorists of ed tech, basically says that, you know, in the main, the study of ed tech has been an area of academia, policymaking, commercial activity, and popular debate, where promises of what might or could or should happen with technology far outstrip the realities of what actually happens, end quote. You know, ed tech researchers may be motivated by altruistic ends and a genuine interest to improve the performance of teachers and learners, but the ed tech field is too often overflowing with affirmative administrative approaches at the expense of those that link ed tech to the reigning political economy of capitalism and the myriad problems that are flowing from that specific system. In this regard, our PE of EdTech is an alternative to EdTech orthodoxy. It lets us paint a big picture of how capitalism, neoliberal government, and the Californian ide ideology shape digital technology to reshape public education. So how do we conceptualize EdTech, you know, as distinct from the rhetorics that I presented you with earlier and distinct from uncritical sort of scholars in this area? Well, basically, we conceptualize ed tech as a fast growing sector of the ICT and cultural industries. And sort of by doing that, we talk about ed tech as, as a business, as industry um, in the first instance. We look at the ed tech business operations of Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, and Microsoft. Um, sometimes those five companies, the biggest five tech companies in the world are described as the GAFAM, which is a popular acronym. Um, but we also look at sort of older ed tech companies, um, you know, some of the legacy firms and then some of the venture capital backed startup companies um, in this market. And we show how ed tech interlinks with a number of contentious uh, processes that you've probably learned about in this course, such as, you know, platformization, the automation of work, uh, platform imperialism, um, and a number of other issues that I'll talk about, you know, in a little bit. So in 1994, EduVentures Inc, um, basically a consortium of investment bankers and consultants to public education <laughs> um, said basically, you know, let's coin a new term. We're gonna coin this term called EdTech. Um, and they basically sort of described EdTech as private run ventures for the public good. You know, and so you see in the 90s, a lot of big companies emerging saying that we're going to sort of find ways to develop educational technologies and models for educating that um, basically sort of privatize, marketize and sell all of this, um, not only sort of to the public institutions of higher education, but also to start acting as direct competitors to public educational institutions. Um, Today, however, ed tech's not provisioned by the state as a public good to all of society. But, you know, most of the time, these are companies driven by Wall Street backed, publicly traded and privately owned corporations looking to capitalize on educational market segments for things like training, self-schooling, degree programs and a la carte course offerings. 
So we define the ed tech um, as a sector of the ICT and cultural industries encompassing all of the for-profit um, companies involved in the financing, production, coordination, distribution of commercial hardware, software, cultural goods, services, and platforms for educational markets. So ed tech is very much an industry. But the question that we ask then, well, what are the leaders of this industry or what set of companies are really at the helm of this sort of fast growing ed tech industry? Um, and what we find is basically that at the top of the ed tech industry, uh, like at the top of most industries in society these days, are the GAFAM, are the Google, the Apple, the Facebook, the Amazon and the Microsoft. So these are enormously powerful transnational but US-based corporations. Um, just recently, the Forbes Global 2000 list ranked GAFAM among the world's top 50 largest corporations in the world by market value. So, I mean, uh, Alphabet Google is the sort of 13th uh, most sort of um, the largest corporation. Uh, it's worth uh, $919.3 billion. Um, and you sort of can just look at each of these firms. They're like nothing we've seen in the history of capitalism in terms of their size and scale um, and uh, of operations. So between um, you know 2000 and um, 2000 and and, and uh, 15 and 19, Gafam's market capitalization jumped by 2.7 trillion dollars. Okay, so in 2020, these five companies, Silicon Valley's big five achieved a total combined market capitalization valuation of $6.4 trillion, a 53% increase from 2019. That's in the context of the global COVID-19 pandemic, where these companies um, have really, really expanded even more aggressively and more intensively everywhere. So you see this is indicated by their market valuation now, a 53% increase from last year at 6.4 trillion. That sum, 6.4 trillion, now if you just think about these numbers, that sum is greater than the combined 2019 gross domestic product of Australia, Canada, France, and the United Kingdom four of the world's wealthiest countries, right? So these five companies, again, have a greater valuation than the total GDP of four of the world's greatest uh, wealthiest countries, you know, including Canada. Um, Gafam's gigantic valuation is also over two times the combined GDP of every country on the continent of Africa. So you take every single country on the continent of Africa, you then sort of add the GDP up of each of those countries together, and these basically five companies um, have a, a valuation that's over two times that sum. It's immense wealth, it's immense economic and capital power, um, obviously, when you look at this data. So, um, you know, it's also important to point out that GAFM CEOs are some of the world's wealthiest billionaires, or, you know, if you want to sort of do the, the sort of Marxist position on it, these are the richest of the global ruling class. The combined net worth of Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, Larry Page, Sergey Brin, and Tim Cook is a whopping $539.3 billion, right? There's a few billionaires and their net worth combined is $539.3 billion. Now, the personal fortune of these five white American men exceeds the 2019 combined gross domestic product of Alberta, Manitoba, New Brunswick, Newfoundland and Labrador, Nova Scotia, Nunavut, and the Northwestern Territories, right? So this is an immense sum of money. Um, and I think the latest that I read about Jeff Bezos was that he sort of makes something like $3,000 every four seconds. Um, and it would take sort of the average Amazon worker working one of those warehouses or one of those delivery networks to, you know, work their entire life, life to sort of make what Bezos does in about an hour. So these are massive disparities in terms of wealth and power, you know, as reflected both by the GAFAM as a set of companies and by the sort of rulers or the owners or the executive class of those companies um, that really are at the top of the global uh, socioeconomic hierarchy um, with more money than we could ever imagine. So it's important to note again, what are the drivers of the ed tech industry today, right? That's the GAFAM. The GAFAM are at the top of the pyramid, so to, so to speak. They are sort of the leading educational technology companies in the world today, just as they're sort of leading many, many other companies uh, as well. So all of the GAFAM have rolled out educational technology divisions, subsidiaries, startups, platforms, devices, services, 
And they're advancing a new business model conceptualized by Nick Cernicek as platform capitalism and what Shoshana Zuboff um, calls surveillance capitalism. While the GAFM are into much more than ed tech, it's appropriate to call GAFM ed tech companies because they are behind data-driven platform-based products and services um, for educational administration, curricular and course content production and distribution, student performance tracking, uh, and class management. So the EdTech's um, platform mechanisms, um, sort of riffing on this great book, The Platform Society, um, basically entail mechanisms of datification, commodification, and selection. So datification basically means that these companies are rendering into and capturing data about aspects of a user's social life that were hitherto unquantifiable. Uh, commodification means they're transforming data about the life activities, relations, preferences, labors, emotions, and ideas of users into commodities. And selection means that they're steering user interaction algorithmically, user attention, with algorithms that select or curate the content users are exposed to based upon inferences about their personal interests, desires, and wants. And so this model of platform capitalism, of the mechanisms of the platform society, are very much being applied to higher education, to public education, to processes of teaching and learning um, by, by, the, by the GAFM. Um, and so very much platform capitalism is the classroom. You know, there's sort of no sort of line anymore increasingly between, you know, the classroom sort of of the, of the public university or the high school or the elementary school um, and sort of these logics of, of GAFM driven platform capitalism. So it's very, very much, very much new. Um, so I'm, I've got sort of a snapshot of, of some of the GAFM's current ed tech or operations, but I think I'm going to skip ahead a bit because um, I just don't want to describe all of the different uh, subsidiaries um, and markets these companies are engaged in. It's a little bit too business boring for me right now. But, you know, each of these big GAFM firms has entire sort of sectors, segments of their operations um, that are very much involved in, in ed tech. So, you know, Google for education, Apple plus education, you know, wonderfully uplifting comments like ignite the creativity in every student. Apple's going to do that, not sort of your professor or your university. You know, Apple's sort of the idea is that it's presenting sort of a better model for doing education. Facebook for education as well. You know, everybody gets to use Facebook for education so long as they click, I agree to have, you know, data collected and aggregated and monetized in exchange with advertisers for our attention. Um, even Amazon, you know, a company that we don't really think about being uh, so much involved in this model um, is very much not only involved in platform, cap plat platform capitalism, um, but very much involved in, in the ed tech industry as well. Um, Amazon recently launched two ed tech service divisions described by Amazon as an open collaboration service that helps teachers easily discover, gather, and share quality educational content with their community. Um, Amazon Inspire aggregates digital learning resources um, and so on and so forth. Um, so this very much links to Amazon's web services, which accumulated 25.7 billion in revenue, um, almost double its 2017 take. So, you know, Amazon's building out its ed tech uh, divisions and operations. And one of the oldest uh, Gatham companies involved in this is Microsoft. Microsoft's been in a business of education since the 80s. Um, and in 18, 2018, Microsoft's tripartite divisions, productivity and business processes, intelligent cloud and more personal commuting had a record fiscal year, taking 110 billion in revenue. Um, and basically it says that, you know, to prospective customers, we offer budget friendly devices for every classroom and sell personalized learning tools and platforms um, to educational institutions, teachers and learners. Um, so there's just, again, a lot of different sort of examples of these GAFM companies as being very much in the business of ed tech. But the GAFM companies, you know, even though they're at the top, I think, of the industry structure, um, slightly beneath them, maybe sort of more middle range firms, but, you know, very powerful and significant in their own right, are what we call um, online program management companies. And the biggest five of these are Wiley Education Services to you academic partnerships, BISC and Pearson Embinet. So I wanna tell you a bit about how online course management companies work, how the business model works um, and some of the, the concerns have, the, have been raised about them. So in the United States, nearly 80% of the more than 2,600 public colleges and universities that offer online degree programs 
outsource the design, management, and advertising of these online you know, programs to these companies. So again, what, what I just sort of said was that, you know, there's, you know, there's a lot, you know, more than 80% of the fully online degree programs in the United States outsource the sort of creation, management, and advertising of those university and college programs to these, these companies, these online program management companies. Um, basically, the business goes back to the 90s. Universities and colleges were sort of responsible for, you know, departments, curriculums, programs, course descriptions, and titles. Um, but they sort of hired these OPM firms to adapt this content for the internet, design platforms to intermediate between professors and students, and then advertise this as an enriching e-learning experience, you know, the like e-learning concepts, very 90s. Um, so what do they get in return for this service? You know, so, you know, what do these companies get from, from, from universities and colleges sort of providing this sort of, you know, conversion to online course service? Um, well, basically they started taking a percentage of the tuition that students paid to enroll in these online programs offered by public universities and colleges. Um, currently online program management corporations pocket about 50 to 60% of the total tuition that students pay for online programs offered by public universities and colleges. So in the United States, for every $60,000, uh, you know, of an online bachelor's degree, a student enrolls in and pays and completes, an OPM company takes about $30,000. And hundreds of millions of dollars flow to these companies every year. So then you have this interesting dynamic whereby OPM firms help some of the GAFM prosper too, because then they sort of take a portion of that revenue that they're paid sort of by public universities and colleges. And then they pay GAFM companies like Google and, Ama Google and Facebook to then advertise and publicize their university and college online programs. Um, so all of the sort of companies get sort of wealthy along the way. Um, a little over 10 years ago, only Pearson and a few other uh, OPM companies existed, but today nearly 40, 50 or so compete for tuition splitting contracts with their university business partners in an online education market worth more than 1.1 billion annually and rising each and every year since um, 2015. So, you know, a lot of these OPM companies have been called wolves in sheep's clothing. Um, students that enroll in these programs are basically paying half of their increasing and expensive tuition to these, these private companies. Um, so while the, the GAFM and OPM companies aim to produce and sell ed tech hardware, software and services to public institutions of higher education, there's also this move in Silicon Valley to you know, knock public institutions of education right out of the ballpark, so to speak. Um, and as Ben Williamson notes, technology companies are not only investing billions of dollars in ed tech, but also creating their own alternative schools. The idea that Silicon Valley companies can run their own schools um, and completely bypass, again, the traditional institutions of public education. Uh, for example, Alt School, a chain of schools based on makerspaces established by a former Google executive and XQ Scooper uh, Super School project, uh, crowdsourcing project to redesign American high schools funded by the wife of Apple's late Steve Jobs, are prototypical Silicon Valley startup schools. Uh, according to Williamson, these Silicon startup schools constitute a powerful shared algorithmic imaginary that seeks to disrupt public schooling through the technocratic expertise of Silicon Valley venture philanthropists and also Silicon Valley capitalists. So, well, these kind of alt schools, these Silicon Valley alt schools or startup schools represent the displacement of public education institutions for the short term, it's not really sort of in the works. You know, it's not like the GAFM and other companies just want to completely, you know, replace uh, public education. For the short term, what they want to do is turn a big profit on public education. So the GAFM and Wall Street are most intent on disrupting public education by investing and in launching ed tech startups in pursuit of future returns. For example, the Gates Foundation grants and Chan Zuckerberg Initiative seed funds to catalyze numerous ed tech ventures. Uh, Wall Street backs ed tech startups as well. In 2018, over 1,000 ed tech firms were invested in. And in 2019, global investments in ed tech reached an all-time high of 18.66 billion. And then ever since the pandemic started, I mean, these, these markets are just skyrocketing. Um, and you see all kinds of investments by um, you know, Wall Street and venture capital um, into these firms. So um, 
you sometimes see, um, you know, basically uh, GAFM executives and then venture capitalists teaming up to support new tech, uh, ed tech startups. So, for example, Everfy, a company that claims to be revolutioning, revolutionizing online education and training for students, landed $251 million in backing from the billionaires such as Google's Eric Schmidt and Amazon's Jeff Bezos. Uh, the India-based um, BYJU, which invites visitors to its website to fall in love with its learning platform, um, basically um, landed $170 million from the um, Chan Zuckerberg initiative, uh, which is run by Facebook, basically. Um, you've got a lot of massive open um, online course kind of corporations like Udacity absorbing 161 million, um, being launched with support of Google Ventures and Andreessen Horowitz. Um, so, you know, you really, really just see sort of massive investments in this sector. And, you know, and of course, when, when financiers invest in a sector, they want a return on investment over time. Uh, and so really the question becomes, well, where do they sort of get their return? Well, they get the return from, again, public educational institutions um, and the professors and learners that, that uh, constitute the, the, the human element of them. Uh, as well. So given the imperative of the Gatham and Wall Street venture capital to generate money far in excess of their initial investment from edtech startups over space and time, it's no surprise that CBS Insights defines edtech startups as, quote, those corporations working to replace or supplement traditional educational systems. So as they grow in society, uh, these edtech startups aim to become necessities, you know, not just things that we can elect or choose to pick up or put down or use or learn with or teach without our discretion, but things that will become essentially embedded with the overarching structure and institutions of society and of higher education as a whole. So, I mean, the, the idea is to sort of create these as new opportunities, new choices, new things that we might opt or elect to do, but ultimately over time lock us in at every level uh, to these platforms and services. And that's probably gonna take about 10 years or so if the GAFM game plan uh, goes as, as intended. Um, so, you know, they're searching for crisis to capitalize on. Um, and as we know, the COVID-19 pandemic has been a boon to their business. Um, these companies may gather and eventually aggregate maximal users of their platformed educational products and services to create powerful network effects that may deter learners from public education as a whole. Then having sort of disrupted uh, traditional education, public education, established a new quasi-monopoly arrangement that locks teachers and students into their platform. What they do then is they go public, jack up costs, and ask people to pay a premium for the privatized educational service because public providers no longer exist. And so very much this relates to what some call a freemium business model. You know, you sort of give the service for free for a certain um, um, period of time. And you find ways to basically, um, you know, monetize user data or whatnot, or ultimately over time, you go from being a freemium model to a subscription based model, and then you jack up costs. And then there's really not much competition left because the GAFM and a few other companies control the entire market and they basically can set prices and it becomes um, a seller's, not a buyer's market, uh, to, so to speak. Um, so that's kind of interesting. So the GAFM's EdTech genie is out of the bottle and it will be very difficult, if not impossible, to put it back in if we would ever wanna do that. But you know, it's very, very hard to reverse the clock, go back in time, social change happens and the effects of those changes simply cannot be undone. Um, so there is momentum, there's technological momentum, there's a soft determinism that is starting to emerge, but it's important to point out that it's not the technology, it's the interest groups, it's the agencies, it's the organizations, it's the companies, it's the government policymakers that are very much driving this change, not technology in and of itself. And that's again, a key insight of the political economy of ed tech as distinct from say a philosophy of determinism um, or one of pure sort of liberal instrumentalism. So ed tech is part of the contemporary ICT and cultural industries. Um, and at the helm of ed tech are the GAFM, OPMs and financialized startups. All of these roll out business models within and extract value from public education, teachers and learners. In many ways, these and other firms push platform capitalism into the classroom blurring the boundaries between private venture and public education, 
education and exploitation, learning and laboring, students and digital workers. You know, it's kind of like to use an old concept, this is the social factory in digital capitalism, you know, being extended and expanded um, by these big GAFM ed tech companies. Um, so that's interesting. Now I want to sort of bring up a few of the, the, the other components of a political economy analysis. What I basically presented to you is the economics, you know, the business model, the market segments, the big companies that own control of this stuff. But, you know, any political economist sort of worth their salt needs to also talk about the state and needs to talk about government and needs to talk about law, policy and regulation. Because a lot of the time, you know, markets, economies, they're shaped by, by government. They're not simply autonomous from market, but there's very much sort of interesting intersections between the conduct or the activities uh, of, of government and then actually what's also going on in markets at times, right? And so we wanna say like, you know, what position is the government? And what position have big governments, you know, in, in the US and elsewhere taken on ed tech? Um, what position are politicians and parties taking on ed tech? You know, are they sort of like excel Accelerating these changes? Um, are they being basically, you know, mimicking or emulating the policy positions advanced to them by the GAFM on what education should become? You know, or are they actually engaging the public, uh, citizens, uh, you know, such as you and I? And it's the same de de deliberation again about the pros and cons, costs and benefits, you know, um, and and so on uh, with these changes. Well, most of the time, you see GAFM and other tech companies lobbying government pushing their policy interests, getting those policy interests adapted as public policy um, to sort of, you know, smooth these transitions with little uh, resistance, let alone some kind of idealistic public sphere where citizens deliberate, you know, about matters of common importance, like the future of the economy or education. So that's kind of what, what, what sort of is happening. So, you know, I'll just sort of make a few remarks about, about the role of politics here. Um, you know, again, for this really to work, companies always require tacit and sometimes explicit buy-in from governments, politicians, educational policymakers, administrators, and somewhat significantly teachers and learners. Um, we are kind of like often last in line when it comes to consultation. Uh, on these matters. Um, so fortunate for the GAFM, many US politicians across the Republican Democratic divide seem to be sure that ed tech should fundamentally disrupt and transform public education forever. It's not enough to simply say that we're living in a global pandemic and there's emergency measures. And yes, online learning has a place. And yes, online learning will continue to have a place in the future. But the other sort of you know, issue is to say, well, will it always already only be online learning? You know, is there a way to sort of do better blended approaches or hybrid approaches or mix kind of a roster of courses, some of those being fully online, some of those being face to face, some of those being in between. From the GAFM's point of view, the future will be fully online digital. Um, distributed educational experiences. And I mean, we, we may like that, we may not like that. You know, it can be very, very subjective. Um, we have different approaches to teaching and learning and that's totally cool. But the point I'm trying to make is that there's been little sustained public deliberation about these matters that actually acts as an input into the government policymaking process. Um, it's kind of just been an emergency scenario, a state of exception. Um, and this is the new new. And the idea is that this new new will be the new future um, and we can't go back. But this again didn't start with the pandemic, okay? You know, the roots of these changes sort of precedes the pandemic. During um, his second term in office, US Democratic President Barack Obama championed, you know, MOOCs and flipped classrooms as, quote, a rising tide of innovation that has the potential to shake up higher educational landscapes forever. Um, Newt Gingrich, the Republican um, speaker, um, basically argued that universities and colleges should emulate and improve upon the business model of digital video and social media companies, opining, quote, when most information and knowledge is transmitted digitally and increasingly personalized, think about how Netflix, Twitter, and Facebook work. We should be able to do that in higher education and do much better. So basically, Gingrich here is basically saying that, you know, universities and colleges should be more like Facebook, Twitter, and Netflix. Well, should they be? <laughs> um, U.S. President Donald Trump's and his wife Ivanka, um, you know, if he ever leaves office, which we of course hope he will now that he's lost the election, um, big proponent of ed tech as well, um, champions of ed tech. And here's a little story about um, Trump's Secretary of Education that that um, you know may sort of cause you some consternation. Um, Trump's Secretary of Education was named Betsy Davos, and I don't know if you know about Betsy Davos's profile in the United States, but here I'll share it with you. Basically, Betsy Davos is the sister of Eric Prince, founder of the mercenary company Blackwater USA. 
Blackwater USA was the mercenary company the US Department of Defense hired to conduct strategic operations during the very contentious invasion and occupation and war in Iraq. So Betsy Davos basically gets appointed by Trump to be the whole country's education secretary in charge of educational policy for the whole country. And she's sister to head of a mercenary corporation. Um, also, Davos is wife to um, Dick Davos, who is CEO of the Pyramid Scheme Company, Amway. I'm not sure if you read up about pyramid schemes, but Amway is a big example of that. And also to make another point, Davos is a member of the 88th richest family in America. So Davos is a billionaire, sister to um, basically a head of a mercenary company that's very controversial. Um, basically married to someone who's part of a pyramid scheme and also has no experience ever in her lifetime teaching or learning or working with educators, nor has any experience or knowledge about educational policy, but was nonetheless appointed by Trump to be the secretary of the entire country's educational policy. Odd choice, um, but, but you know, consistent with Trump appointing a bunch of other billionaires to his cabinet to run the country over those four years. So since joining the Trump administration, Davos pushed the privatization of public education. She pushed for more digital charter schools. She pushed for more uh, ed tech Silicon Valley solutions to what she considered public educational problems. Um, she even said, you know, at this summit, at this sort of event for investment bankers, tech CEOs, and heads of hundreds of ed tech startups, she basically compared um, universities and colleges to cell phone companies uh, like AT&T and Verizon. She said, if you can't get cell phone service in your living room, then that particular provider failed you and they should be you know, put out of business. So Davos uh, suggested that for educations to succeed, they would need to hire ed tech companies to help them. You know, the idea is that we don't know what's best, even though we've basically been working in higher education for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. We're going to have a bunch of Silicon Valley technocrats that don't have PhDs, that have never sort of gotten degrees about teaching and learning, come in and teach us how to run universities and run classrooms like a business. Very, very, very insulting, given the amount of work that most professors need to do to earn their PhDs, to publish research, to develop pedagogical methods, and to um, work with students um, each and every day of their life and do what they love. But Davos just said, eh, we know best. Billionaires like her, Silicon Valley technocrats have something to teach us, was basically the, the message. Um, at the same time, we see many universities welcoming ed tech companies, um, you know, warmly welcoming ed tech companies um, by boards, presidents, administrators, you know, and this is a branding opportunity, you know, when you actually partner up with ed tech companies or the GAFM, you look to sort of be a very forward leaning, modern, digitally savvy, cutting edge institution. And as competition between universities in the digital age becomes ever more fierce, you're going to see sort of more and more sort of university uh, leaders glomming on to sort of Silicon Valley rhetorics to position themselves to recruit and retain students that want to get a foothold as workers in the digital economy. And so this is also something that's being embraced at higher levels of university governance. So, you know, in a nutshell, the conditions, um, you know, political conditions, not just economic conditions, are very conducive to the profit motives of the ed tech industry. Um, and you also sort of have to, you know, think about the fact that this also interlinks with bigger structural changes. Um, universities and colleges have for the past four decades increasingly been restructured by the policy framework of neoliberalism and the new public management to basically sort of again run as businesses. Um, um, you know, Donald Trump said we got to run government like a business and other people like that's not the best way to run government because government's not business. They're uh, motivated by different sort of processes and ends. Um, but nonetheless, the idea is that universities should run like a business. And you have all of these new books that have been published over the past 20 years. Like uh, one of the famous ones was uh, Sheila Slaughter and Gary Rhodes' Academic Capitalism, The New Economy. Uh, more recently, Academic Capitalism, The Age of Globalization. And you have other kind of keywords emerging, kind of like, you know, Ivy and Industry or Academic Capitalism or Academia Inc. and so on. And so basically the, big, the basic argument made by these researchers that are basically in this sort of study of, you know, critical education studies or the political economy of education, say that universities and colleges have basically been reconfigured, redesigned over the past four decades to be structurally functional in the first instance to the labor market needs of companies and to the broader economy. 
Um, and so, you know, if you even go back and read some curmudgeonly essays by sort of, you know, structuralists like Louis Alt is there, they talked about sort of education as reproducing the conditions of possibility for capitalist accumulation by basically, you know, producing workers for capital to hire um, and, and having no other sort of function in society. Um, and that was really, really criticized at the time. I mean, like, that's so cynical. Of course, education so much more um, than that. It plays a vital role in democracy. It plays a vital role in sort of creating conditions of possibility for sort of individuals to be free, um, to learn to think critically, analytically, to communicate, to collaborate, uh, to sort of, you know, engage in socially useful work and to make a difference in the world. But, you know, over time, there's always just sort of been this increasing fettering of education to market activities and market imperatives. Um, and it's a really interesting set of expectations when you think about it, because, of course, public universities and colleges do not control labor market dynamics. You know, universities and colleges do not control whether or not a big corporation decides to automate 4,000 jobs or create them next week. Public universities and colleges don't control whether or not a company decides to outsource or offshore, you know, 10,000 jobs to another country, you know, or not. Uh, public educators don't control what capital's doing. Um, but yet more and more, there's this expectation that we control the labor market outcomes of the students we graduate. And we're in some way responsible for those futures. You know, the idea here is that capital wants public institutions to serve it but it doesn't really want to give us much back in return apropos sort of decreasing corporate tax rates over time, so on and so forth. So interesting contradictions these days. Um, so what you see sort of happening more and more are critical debates emerging around ed tech and the future of higher education. And I'm just touching upon some of these dynamics here. Um, before um, the Kim pandemic happened, there was a lot of um, tension in the province of Ontario around um, the conservative sort of, you know, Doug Ford's attempt to make online learning mandatory, you know, um, and that was very much pushed through um, during the pandemic, of course, for good emergency measures. And I don't, I'm not sort of trying to dismiss or ignore those. I mean, they're essential. I mean, we don't, we want to be safe. We want to be healthy. And this all makes sense right now. Um, but think about the future. Where is this going? Um, two things to consider, two critical issues that come up. The first is the automation of education. Um, we see automation accelerating in society. Um, you know, no sector of the economy is safe from automation. Um, companies basically invest in automation technologies. It's a way to reduce labor costs, it's a way to create more efficient processes. Um, there's always been an assumption, even among new economy theorists and post-industrial society thinkers like Daniel Bell, um, that, that educators could not be automated. The idea is there's something very special or specific about the work that educators do that's not kind of automatable. But many sort of of the GAFM companies today and the ed tech companies are very much moving in the direction of trying to automate the, the processes of teaching and learning, uh, teaching especially. Um, so no sector is safe uh, from automation uh, today. Um, and there's a lot of interesting work in, in this area as, as well. A um, lot of different uh, teaching machines uh, being rolled out in, in the marketplace, um, like this friendly robot um, and so on. Um, the other sort of thing that comes up, another critical issue related to this area is, um, you know, the disjunct between dreams of a global educational village and the reality of a handful of companies based in one country really dominating the market for higher education around the world through these platforms. Um, this sort of brings us to this sort of issue of, um, you know, I guess what you'd call platform imperialism, uh, a concept raised by Dalyong Jin uh, in a book a few years ago, uh, data colonization, um, and a few others, you know, and, and you have this wonderful quote from McLuhan back in 67, you know, McLuhan predicted that the growth of the world communications net would transform education, the movie, radio and TV would breach the wall in and out of school and join all people everywhere in a classroom without walls. You know, and that's a beautiful sentiment. Very much that's what we're doing right now, so to speak. We're in kind of a classroom without walls. I mean, safe, of course, from the walls in my condominium unit and the walls in your bedrooms and, and elsewhere. Um, but, you know, the idea here is that new media for McLuhan would not only connect learners from many different countries, but transform the place of learning, expanding it from the brick and mortar classroom to the world itself, the entire planet we live in. McLuhan enthused, quote, the little red schoolhouse is already well on its way toward becoming the little round schoolhouse, end quote. And McLuhan hoped that by 1989, the globe would be the school and, quote, education in the sense of learning to love, to grow, to change, would be the joyful whole of existence itself. 
you know, lovely McLuhan quote, you know, quote. Um, you know, so today, you know, some say McLuhan's dream of the educational, you know, village has materialized. Um, and there's definitely something to this, but there's inequities and asymmetries as well. I mean, the leading companies, again, are US-based. Uh, many sort of uh, critical researchers have theorized these companies as platform imperialists. Um, and there's asymmetrical and equitable power relations between these companies and the educational institutions, teachers and learners in other countries. Even when we talk about sort of like, you know, wow, a MOOC is going to allow the best professors in the world to teach and reach the most students everywhere all the time. They're really talking about the best teachers as some Harvard or Princeton Americans, you know? They're not really talking about, well, what can other countries and their teachers and learners teach us here in the West or in the North? The idea is very much uh, a one-way flow, a transmissive model of education from the countries and companies based sort of in the most powerful se sectors or regions to the rest of the world, usually the sort of poorer countries of the world as well. Not a two-way flow, not a genuine dialogical exchange. It's a few countries and companies really, really leading this, where others are seen as recipients or receivers uh, of these quasi edtech gifts. Um, so that's another sort of uh, thing to consider. Um, as a critical issue. And um, another sort of, uh, I'll put two more forth and then I'll, then I'll stop. Um, another sort of few issues here is just about um, basically this, this digital native concept or this idea that, that, that your generation, uh, that, that Gen Y, Gen Z and Gen Z or whatnot are basically the ones driving this. When I read a lot of marketing material for uh, the disruption and transformation of higher education. It basically goes like this. You demand it. You're in the driver's seat. You control this. Students want this. Students are basically calling for this. You know, an apropos sort of, you know, cybernetic feedback loops between, you know, producers and consumers, you know, corporate sellers of ed tech devices and services and buyers, i.e. us, the idea is that the consumer is already right and you're the consumer and you've all collectively chosen this future of higher education. Now, I don't know, I'd be very curious to know what you think and what you sort of imagine the future of higher education to be and what role you think higher education should play in society and sort of what models it should be based upon. But I don't often see a lot of the GAFM or the big ed tech companies really consulting you, even though they speak on your behalf all the time and make claims and statements about what you want and need um, uh, from higher education today. Um, another contradiction that, that, that sort of comes up is that when you actually study the Silicon Valley techno elites, so to speak, they're not all that enthusiastic about their own business model for education when it comes to their own kids, you know, or their own sort of family members. Um, when you actually study where the wealthiest Silicon Valley kids of the world are going to school, they're not really going to school <laughs> online uh, through a platform provisioned by a massive open online course corporation. Rather, they're in these very, very personalized, very, very intimate, very, very sort of face-to-face, -face, very, very brick and mortar learning places where they have small classrooms of like 15 to 20 people, two or three great educators that can sort of focus all their time and energy on sort of the learning experiences of those kids. Um, and, um, you know, emphasizing, you know, not sort of labor market relevant skills per se in the first instance, but rather, you know, competencies like creativity, communication, critical thinking, collaboration, you know, so well, the privileged few responsible for digital technologies and ed tech exercise immense caution and care when it comes to educating their own kids less privileged public teachers and students in public schools are now being expected to buy into whatever Silicon Valley is doing to disrupt how they teach and learn. And that doesn't seem right, nor does it seem fair. So moving forward, I want to encourage all educators, all students to guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence and power pursued or achieved over public education by the ed tech industry. Fortunately, many citizens are asking critical questions about the big five firms behind much of the ed tech uh, transition. The GAFM are surrounded by controversy and they've been criticized for displacing public service, disrupting unions, degrading labor rights, 
denigrating personal privacy, exerting propriety control over user data, designing algorithmic echo chambers and profiting on fake news and disinformation. Given the titans of the digital age also now seem to be ruling ed tech, the more embedded they become in public education, the more social problems they will affect will become problems that affect all educators. A political economy of ed tech invites us to disrupt these processes and scrutinize the inequitable power relations that the ed tech industry preserves and changes. By understanding and interrogating these dynamics, we can begin to rescript ed tech as a site for sustained public debate and democratic imagination for the future of higher education today. In that regard, we welcome new studies of the ed tech industry that might confirm, dispute, update, complement, or complicate, or refine the positions we advance in our book. All in all, we want to see more political economy of ed tech research that intervenes in popular and public policy debates about the future and the present of education and ed tech's role and impact, so that we can restore some agency, some sovereignty to the people, of course, that these decisions and these technologies affect. That's a great question, you know, thanks so much. I distinguish myself from, I think, some of those that would see the problems um, that I've identified in, in this presentation um, with, you know, technology applied to teaching and learning in and of itself. I've been teaching and learning with digital technologies for 15 years. Um, the courses I teach are very much hybrid or blended and they have been for a very long time. And I sometimes worry that the argument that I'm advancing will be misrecognized as some kind of knee-jerk luddism or some kind of technophobia or techno dystopian position. And it's really, really not the case at all because you know I, I've again always used sort of digital technologies in my teaching and learning uh, experiences. I mean, I, I actually had a very serious injury last winter, which made me sort of get the sort of jump on online learning. Um, and I delivered both of my courses online um, in, in the winter of 2020. Um, and then basically as I was recovering, the pandemic started and then there was the emergency measures and the rapid shift to online. So I kind of had a head start with Zoom teaching. Um, and, um, you know, so I, I think I'm adapting, I'm adjusting as best I can. Um, there's pros and cons of this experience from my point of view. Um, I, I initially was worried that attendance would be low, but actually attendance has been about the same. And I see usually the same patterns, uh, you know, whereby everyone shows up in the first five, six, seven weeks, and then attendance starts dropping by the end of term. Um, one of the things that I also sort of, you know, very maybe medium sort of centric sort of claim is that I think that we're all very much like entertainers now. We might as well just be YouTube influencers and Twitch streamers, you know? It's like, and that's kind of interesting, that's exciting. Um, but it's also, I mean, but also it's not new because I remember like Neil Postman, you know, back in the sort of amusing ourselves to death book was basically saying that, you know, television turned, you know, all educators into entertainers. And if they weren't entertainers, they would lose their audience, you know? So they even looked like Postman was saying that back in 88 or whatever that book was published in. And so again, I think more and more we're expected to be kind of, you know, social media entertainers. And that's a different way to teach it's a different way to engage. Um, it requires a lot of training, uh, that requires skills that we're not taught to develop when we're doing our PhDs. And, and moreover, I mean, when you speak about generations and sort of you know, digital literacies and so on and so forth, we have to remember that there, there are generations of amazing, brilliant professors that have been teaching in one way that it might be called traditional, but it shouldn't be dismissed as bad because it's traditional. And one of the things I don't like about a lot of the rhetoric surrounding digital teaching is that old ways of teaching and learning were somewhere inferior or not useful or something like that. And that's simply not the case. And so I think that, that you know, I guess I would, I grew up, um, I was like a, what, a, a Gen X millennial, whatever, gen, you know, you're probably a millennial, I don't know. And we've had computers, we've had smartphones. We've, I played video games when I was eight years old. Like I've been part of this for a long time. And so I can adjust and adapt relatively easy um, to the new conditions, but, I think for many, many, many others, it's a very steep learning curve, you know? And I think that we have to be sensitive about that. And we shouldn't just sort of cast them as like, you know, traditional, you know, and useless, you know? It's a traditional and valuable, you know? And there's just different modalities for teaching. And I don't think we should be privileging one over the other. I think we should be saying, you know, there's a lot of different methods, a lot of different pedagogical approaches, a lot of different ways of doing teaching. And we should sort of be holistic about it and sort of, you know, take what we can, use what we can, and not sort of throw the baby out with the bathwater just because it might be getting cold, you know?
Yeah. Basically, in a nutshell, it's very, very hard to aggregate data about teachers and learners in a face-to-face, -face, physically interactive classroom place, you know, um, unless we're all basically plugged into one of the sites or services that the ed tech companies are running while in the physical classroom. The model of platform capitalism or surveillance capitalism means we have to be, you know, continuously um, you know, plugged into interacting through these platforms. Um, and we know when we click, I agree, you know, or I consent to, to the terms and conditions of service, you know, there are those clauses that say, yeah, we're gonna collect all your data or whatnot. But that's, that's really sort of the basis for their, their, their business model. And so I think by sort of shuttling or accelerating or propelling sort of all of us to be constantly, perpetually, permanently interacting through these platforms, it ensures like a constant return of data. I don't really think they care too much about, you know, old ways of teaching and learning. I don't really think that they would say, oh, you know, physically proximate teaching and learning is qualitatively better. And actually many of the PR and marketing and advertising people hired by these companies are basically waging a full frontal assault on that notion of traditional learning. They're not really that informed, but again, it's a rhetoric. The idea is that we want to shake up, we want to disrupt higher education, and that means that we need to create a negative impression of our the competitors, the old model, <laughs> and we need to create a positive impression of the new model that our, that our clients or that the companies we work for are pushing and selling. And I mean, it sounds cynical and it sounds conspiratorial, but it's not, it's just business. Like these are businesses, they have PR and advertising wings. PR and advertising people are hired to sort of, you know, promote their service and platform and basically, you know, find ways of delegitimizing or casting doubt on older ways of doing things, whether that be a public educational institution, you know, or a competing company. I mean, the idea that, you know, you can have a qualitatively different and better educational experience based upon your class position or your privilege in society um, just seems wrong to me. I mean, it just goes against every principle of social justice that I sort of would hold dear to my heart. Um, it, it goes against kind of rhetorics of like inclusive, integrative, you know, equitable, democratic education for society. And it's really what these companies are pushing to sort of prosper from. So it's saying, yeah, if we marketize and privatize everything, if we knock public educational institutions out of the, the market, so to speak, we basically own and control all of it. And we divide that up in different segments and different sort of, you know, price points for different classes of people based upon, you know, what they can pay. And of course, like, you know, again, many of the wealthy people, many of the wealthy people atop of the American class structure around the world do, do want face-to-face, person-to-person learning experiences for their kids. Um, but what they're saying is like, well, we're going to sell all this other stuff or keep it cheap or find ways to sort of, you know, increase access to all these other people who simply can't afford to have those privileged learning experiences. And I think like, from a normative or moral position, I think the argument that we wanna make again is not that we don't want online learning. I mean, we can do lots of great things with online learning too, but you know, we have to take these kind of considerations um, to heart and we want these to be genuinely universally available and accessible to all, regardless of people's ability to pay. We don't want one or the other, we want both and more. Um, and, and that requires massive investment in public education. Um, and it also requires, I think, a massive change of the kind of type of society we live in too.